it's liberating. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I think one of the uh, privileges of standing up here at the podium is that you're permitted to temporarily unmask. So I, am, uh, I can breathe again for a second, and I feel, I feel wonderful. But what makes me feel more wonderful as director of this museum is to see so many people in this auditorium for the first time in quite literally two years. So um, I think you should give yourselves a round of applause. Um, we're, we're doing everything with maximum consideration and safety, but I think that there is a strong urge among all of us to return to some semblance of normal, and this feels like the first gasp of that at this museum. So I'm so grateful and happy to see so many familiar faces, particularly our trustees, to whom we owe so much in the room with us this evening. So thank you for making the effort. And I think that I can say you'll be rewarded by the experience of the two exhibitions that you'll experience this evening, courtesy of Katie Rothkoff, who I am going to introduce with all due fanfare shortly. So um, it's a delightful evening. I can think of no better way to reopen this museum than by celebrating Matisse. We have many, many jewels in our crown at the BMA, but I would say first among equals is uh, Mr. Matisse, so this, this feels incredibly fitting. Um, the, the exhibition that we're gathered here to celebrate this evening is titled, formally, A Modern Influence, Henri Matisse, Etta Cohn, and Baltimore. In addition to that, you will have the opportunity to see a Juan Gris exhibition in, in the adjacent May Gallery, which I encourage you to take every advantage of, a truly extraordinary show. Um, I want to acknowledge that exhibitions like this are incredibly difficult to undertake, and these two have been at least five years in the making and have been perpetually deferred as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, as you all well know, I think, museums are curtailed in what they can do. The fact that we've been able to do these two exhibitions in this climate is absolutely extraordinary, and while we don't have all of our staff present, I want to acknowledge their efforts in making something um, entirely unusual possible in this museum for the people of Baltimore. So thank you to the staff um, in their absence. In, yes, I think. Um, everything in museums is expensive, and justly so. And so I want to acknowledge those people who have supported our Matisse exhibition this evening. First of them, the Pierre Antana Matisse Foundation. Secondly, the Richard C. Von Hess Foundation. Jeanette Cohn Kimmel, Laura Friedlander, uh, the Robert Lehman Foundation, and of course the Alvin and Fanny B. Tolheimer Exhibition Fund, on whom we draw on a near constant basis to support our special exhibitions. So a hand for all of those generous sponsors. I also want to acknowledge among our many trustees present, our board chair, Claire Samosky siegel who is sitting next to an honorary trustee, a new trustee, and our chair of finance, no less. So the power, if you have any questions about where the power in the room resides, it's right there. Um, I want to say thank you to Claire, because each one of those sponsorships wouldn't have been possible without her, and the many things that we have upcoming in the museum fall into that same category. Um, chair has been Claire, Claire the chair, Chair the Claire, has been um, chair for some time and it's been an extraordinary run, so thank you for all you've done. Um, although I, I don't know how many of these staff members are present, um, I do want to acknowledge a few people very specifically. Leslie Cozy, who is our Associate Curator of Prints, Drawings and Photographs at the museum, co-curated this exhibition along with Katie Rothkoff. She did that in the midst of organizing other smaller exhibitions, moving our entire Works on Paper collection from the third floor to the first floor for the public unveiling of our PDP Center later this year and having a baby. So, <laughs> Leslie, that is a, that is a, a job well done. Um, Laura Albans, who may or may not be here, ably assists uh, Katie Rothkoff in almost everything she does in a curatorial assistant capacity, so we owe her a great debt of thanks. Um, Oliver Schell, who is a curator and interim department head of the European Painting and Sculpture Department, um, also a close collaborator of Katie Rothkoff, giving her the space necessary to do some of these big exhibitions. And Asma Naim, who is our chief curator, I'm not sure whether she's here this evening, if she is, she guides the ship. We have 27 curators, and that's a considerable effort. So thanks to her for making that possible. 
So uh, two more thank yous, and then I'm going to vacate the stage, and we'll absorb some much-needed content. So first of all, um, I want to thank Katie Rothkoff for everything she's done. She, she mentioned to me a couple of nights ago when we had another event celebrating these exhibitions that we talked about three different initiatives five years ago. Those three initiatives were this exhibition that examines the relationship between Matisse and Etta Cohn for the first time intimately with extraordinary accompanying scholarship, a monographic exhibition focused on Juan Gris and the dedication of a center for the study of Matisse at the BMA. Um, five years later, all of those three things have been achieved. And um, sometimes I think we lose track of our aspiration in the time that passes. So it feels like a monumental moment, Katie. So um, I'm grateful for that first conversation. Um, I also do want to note, note Katie's title, um, because it's germane to what's coming up at the museum. She is the Anne and Ben Cohn Memorial Director of the Ruth Armada Center for Matisse Studies and Senior Curator of European Painting and Sculpture at the Baltimore Museum of Art. So I can't memorize that title. I'm sure she hasn't memorized that title, but she's the busiest curator in the United States at the moment. And uh, I think you'll see why later on this evening and shortly when she gives a lecture. Um, and finally, in closing, I think this is probably the most um, poignant and important closing I could offer you. So I think when the general public and uh, citizens of Baltimore think about the BMA and its greatness, which is unequivocal, we think often about the Cone sisters. And I think that that is entirely just. Um, I would also say that part and parcel of our greatness is the contribution of J. McKean Fisher, who for a long time was an esteemed curator at this museum. And, and, and he is, he is, his current title is Emeritus Senior Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs. So um, if the Cone sisters made us great, he amplified that greatness and more than doubled our holdings in Matisse's work in the years that he worked at this museum, which tally 45, which is staggering. So Jay is not with us this evening, but he most certainly is in spirit. And uh, I think that the, our notoriety in this arena is due at least 50% to his contribution over the last almost half century. So um, I'm very happy to dedicate the evening to him and turn it over to Katie Rothkoff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, and uh, yes, I have taken off my mask, <laughs> um, uh, and I, I really very much want to thank you, Chris, for this opportunity. I certainly want to thank the Board of Trustees for supporting all of these wonderful initiatives, uh, and with special thanks, of course, to our amazing chair, Claire Zamoski siegel who makes everything happen, uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful for all, <laughs> and I hear the giggle. Um, I also want to thank my terrific colleagues here at the BMA. Uh, most of the work that, a lot of the work that was done on both shows we'll, we'll be talking about tonight took place in the pandemic. Uh, I wrote two catalogs in a pandemic um, along with uh, great colleagues and it was really quite an unusual, weird and awful and wonderful experience all at once. Um, and uh, the, the things that are similar between the two shows are that they both bring a person to light who's in comp whose accomplishments have been overlooked. And I think that's a link that, that's, that's something that we always want to do in the work we do as curators, is to bring so up something new, something fresh, and something different. So I, I hope you'll enjoy uh, the exhibitions tonight. Um, I will start, let me start. Uh, we will start with A Modern Influence, uh, Henri Matisse, Etta Cohn, and Baltimore. Um, this is a show that, uh, actually I'll start here. This is a show that Jay Fisher and I talked about for a really long time. Uh, in my 21 years at the BMA, we always talked about how Clarabel Cohn, who was the older sister, a, a medical doctor from that first generation of female doctors in this country, was so esteemed, everybody knew her, and her younger sister, Etta, never really got quite the amount of uh, uh, she never, you know, people really never respected her and understood how much she did to make the collection as good as it is. And we really wanted to do a show on it. Uh, we started thinking about it pretty seriously five, six, seven years ago. 
Uh, and then the most wonderful thing happened as Jay and I were continuing to work on it, Leslie Cozy arrived in Baltimore in 2018 um, and became a wonderful partner in the show. With Jay's retirement, Leslie and I co-curated the show together and she is a remarkable scholar and a wonderful curator and a terrific person uh, and I'm sure a wonderful mother. Um, and so it's been just a, just a complete, it's just been wonderful working together. So I want to give her a lot of credit for everything that she's done for this project. Uh, now let's go back to uh, 1906. Um, in 1906, Etta Cohn met Ari Matisse. She, of course, was here, was from Baltimore, had started to collect art in 1898 uh, when she bought five paintings by the American Impressionist Theodore Robinson. And we think this early interest in art uh, probably came from a friendship that she and Clarabelle had with Gertrude and Leo Stein, who were living in Baltimore in the 1890s, going to Johns Hopkins. So that, that first foray into art collecting, which was so exciting for Etta, really st started this amazing career being a collector, and that really was how she saw herself. Um, fast forward several years, Leo and Gertrude moved to Paris. Uh, Etta and Clarabelle start to travel to Europe, uh, Clarabelle doing research in Germany and pathology, Etta visiting her friends in Paris. And in 1905, she was introduced by Pablo to Pablo Picasso uh, by Gertrude Stein, who was sitting for her very famous portrait that's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, Picasso made Gertrude come multiple times. I think it was over 50 sittings, and she was so bored. And she thought, well, maybe her nice girlfriend from Baltimore would be interested in coming and keeping her company. And Etta went, and from that first visit, she bought a couple of works on paper, uh, then went back, brought her sister, bought a few more, and by the end, she and Clarabelle had bought over 100 works by Picasso. Uh, the following year, 1906, uh, Gertrude and Leo's uh, sister-in-law, Sarah Stein, who was married to their older brother, Michael, uh, what had, become, had become interested in the work of Henri Matisse, who of course was Picasso's rival. They were two of like, the greatest artists working in Paris in those early years. And Sarah really liked Matisse's work, so she invited Edda to come to that visit. And from that first visit, Edda bought a couple of works on paper. Um, uh, let me fast forward here, or go forward. Uh, we think probably one of the works, either in the middle or on the right, uh, a, second, a second drawing that she bought, she gave to Sarah as a gift. Uh, she then went back bought, uh, and bought the beautiful watercolor that we see here from 1905, the harbor at Collioure. A very unusual, Matisse didn't do a lot of watercolors, uh, but very beautiful work. Uh, and it, was, it began this long relationship that lasted for 43 years. Later that year, uh, Etta returned and bought her first painting by Matisse, which is this one, the yellow pottery from Provence. Painted in 1905, Etta bought it in 1906. Uh, and to today's eye, if we look at something like Clarabelle's wonderful blue nude that is, uh, graces the Cone Rotunda, uh, that's a work that's so powerful and bold and in your face. And, but in 1906, this painting was pretty powerful and bold and in your face. Uh, to have bought something that was seemingly unfinished, you know, this is all sort of unpainted canvas in the front, the vegetables or fruit on the plate haven't been fully painted in. For Etta to have bought this, brought this back to Baltimore in 1906 must have been shocking to her friends and family who saw it. And it was the beginning of this amazing connection between Etta and, and Henri Matisse. Uh, the show, I'm sort of doing this talk as you'll walk through the show so that when you walk in, you'll get a little bit of understanding about why we've laid it out as we have. Uh, Leslie and I very much wanted to do it generally by acquisition date so that it's clear, so you see how Etta's eye became more, uh, uh, she became more confident and, and her choices became even bolder the, uh, the, the longer she collected his work. Uh, she also was you know, an amazing collector of works on paper and, and bought incredible examples of Matisse's prints and, and drawings. And we've laid them out in, in the order of their making in, in most cases only because we don't know when they were purchased. Uh, it's funny, you know, the Cohn sisters left us oodles of, of documents, you know, diaries and uh, financial records and letters and all of their, we have an, a wonderful archive of their material, but they didn't get as detailed as, of course, we would want. <laughs> they didn't name every print, so sometimes it'll just say group of prints. And so Leslie and I decided just to do them in chronological order uh, to show the, the breadth of the incredible things that she was purchasing, like these works all from 1906. Uh, which really show Matisse experimenting, you know, with abstraction, um, with woodcuts, with really all, all that printmaking had to offer. 
Uh, she also was, of course, a, a, a devoted collector of his sculpture. Uh, Etta bought 18 examples of his sculpture. Uh, he made about 80 in total, so about 20% of his entire output was purchased by Etta. Uh, Clara Ball had her own collection. She had her own collection of sculptures and her own collection of, of some of these prints as well. Uh, and when Etta died in 1949, a lot of those duplicative works, when we had two or three copies of some of the prints or two copies of some of the sculptures, uh, were given to a museum that's now called the Weatherspoon Art Museum in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is where most of the Cohn family lived. In, uh, so the Cohn collection has this, this break uh, after these early purchases that we've seen uh, in 1907, Etta and, and Clarabelle and their brother and, and sister-in-law go for this long trip around the world. And when they come back from the trip, her eldest brother, Moses, uh, starts not to feel well. And it turns out that he was dying. And Etta was able to find, if she found out in time and was able to leave, oops, excuse me, was able to leave France, go back to the United States and be with him when he died. Uh, she ended up staying in North Carolina with his widow for an extended period of time. Uh, we know from letters that she returned to Paris in 1913 for a visit. Uh, it's unclear if she bought anything during that period. And, uh, and then World War II arrived, unfortunately. Uh, Clara Bell was in Germany during World War II, World War I, I'm sorry. Clara Bell was in Germany during World War I. She got stuck there uh, and was there until 1920. So the Cone Collection sort of stops between 1908 and 1920 which of course were really important years in Matisse's, out, in Matisse's um, career as well as in many other artists. Uh, but in 1922, the sisters go back to Paris together, go back to France, and that's when they really start to buy in bulk um, and, and try to get as many examples of Matisse's work as they can, including a wonderful group of works from 1920 and 1921 and 1922. Uh, what's interesting, uh, uh, and paintings I should say, what's interesting is um, in the works that we see here on the screen, they were purchased from Matisse's gallery, Gallery Bernheim Jeune. And in doing research for the catalog, it's very humorous to me anyway, that all of the purchases by either Cohn sister are always credited uh, to Clarabelle. Um, being a younger sister, I find that quite irritating. Um, and so, and I guess it's because she was the older sister, she was the doctor, it's unclear, but we know the sisters made their own choices. They used their own money, and they, they decorated their own apartment separately and, and had works that were theirs. So it's really quite uh, entertaining, um, and maybe not in a great way. Um, on the left is Large Cliff with Fish, which, which is a work that they both owned. So they did occasionally buy things together. Uh, it's a painting that, uh, according to Cone, the Cone family lore, Etta, when she was considering purchasing it, uh, she mentioned, uh, I think to Matisse's daughter, that she was concerned about the fish on the beach and whether or not they survived their modeling session. Um, and she was reassured that Matisse did hire a little boy to water them uh, during the period. So, um, and it hung in her, in her dining room uh, in, in, a, a, in a place of great honor, and Matisse actually posed in front of it, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, then uh, it, we, of course, the painting, The Yellow Dress, is one of the masterpieces of the Cone Collection. Uh, started in 1929, he finished it in 1931. Um, in the meantime, he traveled to Tahiti, uh, he came here to Baltimore. It's a painting that has a long history of, 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 of being made, and uh, Leslie and I decided to make a curatorial um, break from the concept of the show. Uh, in the last 20 years, uh, we, uh, thanks actually to Jay, to Jay Fisher's great work, we've been able to acquire 15 drawings for the yellow dress painting. Uh, I think probably the most of any museum um, that I know of, I mean, the, to have 15 preliminary drawings for any major painting by Matisse is extraordinary. And so we made the decision to include them in the show surrounding the painting, and uh, they're actually hung in order, we think, of how he worked on the canvas. Uh, so it, so take so that you sort of move, go from from right to left um, on either side of the painting, and you can and, and uh, Leslie's written brilliantly about uh, how we think these these works were were laid out, uh, and uh, it's and we and I think part of the reason we did it is we know if Etta had the opportunity she would have picked them up in a minute, so we decided to to do that in the show. When Matisse finished it in 1931. 
Uh, Etta came to visit him the following year, 1932, and needed, you know, of course, wanted to always add to her collection every time she came to Europe. And uh, he agreed to sell it to her. Um, and it was in the time when he was taking a, a break from easel painting. He's decided to work on his first illustrated book, uh, the, poetry, the poems of Stefan Mallarmé, which we'll talk about in a minute. And he was also working on the big, barn, the big mural for the Barnes Foundation outside of Philadelphia. So when um, Etta came the following year in 1933 for her uh, for, to come to see Matisse and to buy something new, there really wasn't anything for her to buy. Uh, he had no easel paintings to show her, but instead he hired the same model to sit in the same spot um, in the outfit as a tableau vivant for Etta, and she loved it. It was one of her favorite stories and really showed the closeness between the two. Uh, Matisse came to Baltimore in 1930. Uh, here he is posing in front of the large cliff in Etta's uh, dining room that I mentioned earlier. Uh, he came here while he was working on the Barnes mural. He was having trouble with the, the correct dimensions for the painting, so he came to visit to, to properly measure it uh, and decided to come to Baltimore. Um, Clara Belcone had died in 1929, uh, and, uh, which was a big shock to the family, a big shock to Etta. And when, in Clarabelle's will, she left everything in her collection to her, to her sister, but said, um, if the city of Baltimore could, could appreciate modern art, could learn to appreciate modern art, she'd love the collection to come here to the BMA. Uh, I don't know how well we would have done in 1929, but luckily we had 20 years uh, before Etta died in 1949 uh, for the city to learn to appreciate modern art a little bit more. Um, and so that moment really changed everything for Etta. She was in charge of the whole collection herself. She didn't have her sister to bounce ideas off of. And, and she became the Cohn sister that was left. Uh, and the visit for Matisse just changed everything for him too. He, had seen, he saw paintings he probably hadn't seen in decades that she had bought by him, major paintings. I'm not sure, for example, the Blue Nude, which Clara Bell Cohn bought in 1926. I can't imagine when he had seen, the last time he had seen it. So for him, it was really an opportunity. He realized that if he played his cards right, he could have a major presence in a museum in the United States. And so from that moment on, he started to sell to Etta some of the greatest things he was making, which is what makes their relationship so extraordinary. Uh, after Clarabelle's death, Etta decided to publish a catalog of the Cone Collection uh, and very much wanted to have a portrait of her sister by Matisse to add to the book. So she contacted him. He asked to, for her to provide some photographs of, Etta, uh, of Clarabelle, which she did. And then while he was working on it, he then contacted Etta or had his daughter contact Etta and say, you know what, I want to do a portrait of each of you. Can you send me some photographs? Uh, and actually in the, in the catalog for the book, for the show, uh, we were able to find some photographs of Etta taken, we think, by uh, Matisse's son Pierre of Etta in Paris that may have been used for her portrait. Um, and we see two of them here, uh, two, of the, two of the portraits. Uh, in the end, Matisse ended up sending 10 portraits, four of Clarabelle and six of Etta, and they were a gift, so no longer a commission, and they were all included in her book. Uh, and she was absolutely thrilled. Uh, in the sort of third and fourth galleries of the show, uh, we decided to sort of take a thematic break from the pure um, chronology and wanted to look at some of the wonderful works, uh, wonderful textiles and decorative art objects that Etta bought. That's, as a, and if you sort of look at Matisse's interiors and the, and the way she fashioned her own interior with his paintings and with decorative arts that looked like his paintings, that she was sort of creating her own Matissean universe in her apartments here in Baltimore. Um, so we see on, this right, on the right this beautiful Suzani uh, that, we've, that we pair uh, with the wonderful interior with Dog from 1934. And I think it really puts the collection in a different context than we're used to seeing it and I think it looks so terrific. Uh, we also have some wonderful sculpture that she bought. Um, for example, I do want to point out uh, Reclining Nude One, Aurora, that you see on the right, which was very much, uh, which was the work that is very uh, attached to the Blue Nude painting. He actually worked on this clay for the bronze first. It was, it was meant to be a sculpture first, and that was what, what Matisse was working on uh, before he had an accident in his studio and dropped the clay to the ground. Uh, and it um, smushed, which is a very technical term. Um, and uh, he ended up turning to the canvas, uh, finishing the painting, and going back and forth between the painting and, and the bronze. And it, uh, it turns out Etta bought that just, it was the first sculpture I think she bought after her sister's death. So she very much wanted to have the sculpture that went with her sister's uh, painting uh, in the collection. 
Uh, we also have a section of the show where we look at Matisse's interest in costume and fantasy. He did lots of these paintings of odalisques, of um, nude and semi-nude uh, sort of harem girls or concubines uh, who all very much look very French and are obviously not from the part of the world where anything like that probably ever happened. Uh, but they, they show his love of play, his love of theater. Matisse loved costumes. You know, he, he was from a, a part of France uh, where they made beautiful haute couture uh, clothing and, and or haute couture uh, fabrics for uh, for the fashion houses of Paris, and he would go out and buy the clothes himself and and make hats and you know really fashioned his models in the most incredible way. So these are, are two wonderful examples. Okay, so we then uh, in as I said earlier, Matisse took this big break from making easel paintings between 1931 and 1934. And one of his projects was this incredible book, his, his first illustrated book uh, of, the poet, of the poems of Stéphane Mallarmé, uh, the French poet who was one of Matisse's favorite. Matisse had been contacted by Albert Skira, who was a young publisher who was interested in starting a publishing house that focused on illustrated books. He first worked with Picasso and that was very successful. Then he turned to Matisse and Matisse agreed to do um, Mallarmé as his big, uh, his really his first major illustrated book project. And Matisse, like he did with all of these projects, he put everything into it. You know, he was interested in every aspect of it. He was interested in the quality of the paper, in the font used for the poetry, in the way everything looked on the page. Uh, and he really slave, he really worked really, really hard on it for a couple of years. Um, halfway through the project, I think he decided he wanted to make a package of all of the materials that went into the making of the book you know, from, the, from early um, drawings, or, or drawings that weren't even that early, to the, the etchings that he made, uh, and he even went ahead and made etchings after the book was finished, because he continued to, to play with all of the ideas from the poems that he was so interested in. There were 29 final prints, but, uh, you know, he made, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of, of works that went into that package. And in 1931, he actually sold, he, he, uh, Edicone, put a down payment on owning this uh, amazing guide to the book, which we refer to here as the Mallarmé maquette. It was a working maquette or a presentation maquette. Uh, Matisse always wanted it to be something that would teach people how he made this wonderful book. And it was sort of a, an exhibition ready to go in his mind. Uh, it features 250 things, including the 29 copper plates that he used in the book, plus five extras um, for rejected, for, for prints that didn't make it. And it's just an incredible thing and something we very rarely show. So this is really the heart of the show, showing you this deep dive into this wonderful thing that, that Etta uh, was able to buy. Uh, it traveled, when she finally finished paying it off and it came, it, it, was, um, it, it was exhibited a couple of times, uh, but then came right here to the BMA for exhibition and has remained here. It was the one thing that Etta didn't take back to the apartment, but she kept, uh, she kept uh, here at the BMA for many years. And so here we see some of the sort of drawings that led to the final print um, for the Jinx, which is one of uh, the earlier uh, or earliest poems in the a book and then the beautiful hair where we see uh, the draw the various drawings and then the final uh, copper plate. We've got about 65 examples um, next door in the beautiful red galleries. Um, so, and uh, Leslie has written beautifully about it in much deeper detail than I can tonight. Uh, so please um, take your time and look at it carefully. Um, the, we then at the sort of the last two galleries of the show, we look at the works that Matisse made that Etta purchased in the 30s and, and, and 40s um, after the maquette uh, a moment. And it's really where their relationship is so cemented. Um, for example, Large Reclining Nude of 1935, uh, that's a work that I think he made in response to having seen the Blue Nude in 1930 during that visit here to Baltimore. Uh, he wanted Etta to have a companion piece. And so he worked on it uh, over the course of six months. He sent her two letters, including uh, 22 photographs of the work in progress, and said, oh, I'm just happening to, you know, I'm just working on a little, you know, reclining nude. I just wanted you to know. I thought you'd be interested. Uh, and it was a part of a bit, you know, he was basically wooing her um, to buy something that he was making for her with, you know, not saying it in that many, in, in those terms. But uh, luckily, she said yes. Um, and uh, she also purchased some beautiful charcoal drawings that are very much related to uh, the finished uh, masterpiece. Uh, 
uh, Purple Robe of Anemones, another work. Uh, I believe, as many of you may have heard, Etta Cohn loved flowers, and I think the anemones were her favorite flower, uh, so that may have not been a complete surprise. Um, and it, that work features uh, one of Matisse's favorite models, Lydia, who uh, came to work for him, for actually first to, as a nurse for his wife, who ended up becoming a terrific model. She then ran the studio for him and became his companion at the end of his life. So there she is in this sort of regal, beautiful robe that does still exist. I've seen it in a show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, very beautiful. Um, and we see her again on the right in the blue eyes, uh, one of the most sort of intimate, uh, very personal paintings that was done just at the same time, along with a, a related and very beautiful drawing. Etta Cohn loved works on paper. She loved all aspects of Matisse's uh, output, uh, but she bought some of the most glorious uh, pen and ink drawings, uh, particularly of, of the 30s, that are just, you know, show the incredible, you know, use of line, use of the page, the whiteness of the page uh, coming through so beautifully. And, and we've, uh, we've got really all of our best drawings on view, and it's very rare that they're all on view at once. Uh, we usually save many of them for special exhibitions, often other places, so it's thrilling to have them all here. Uh, in doing the research for the exhibition, there have been, we've you know, discovered lots of interesting things about their relationship. You know, they corresponded a lot. Uh, it, the correspondence really began after Clara Bell's death in 1929, but Etta and Matisse exchanged, you know, New Year's greetings, holiday greetings, birthday greetings. Uh, they talked about their families, you know, during the, you know, World War II, they worried about each other terribly. Uh, the painting on the left, a ballet dancer seated on a stool is one that in doing the research for the show, I discovered that uh, Etta asked to borrow it over a dozen years before Matisse actually let her do it. Um, you know, as many of you may, may know, when you see photos of him in his studio, there are always beautiful things behind him. And at this point in his career, he really, you know, could sell everything immediately. And it was a question of saving things for the right people. And this was one, uh, his daughter was try, tried to get him to sell it in the 40s to someone in Copenhagen. And she said, what are you, and he said, what are you talking about? It's saved for Etta Cohen. When I'm ready, she'll get it. You know that. Um, so it's sort of humorous seeing that father-daughter uh, kind of relationship. Uh, one of the last sort of highlights of the show, as, as, as um, in the last gallery, are nine of these wonderful prints from the jazz book, which was Matisse's most, probably most successful book, best known book, uh, done in 1947, and it very much looks forward to um, the paper cutouts that he did at the end of his career. Uh, Etta Cohn, unfortunately, died in 1949, just before he turned to cutouts as his major uh, artistic output, so we don't uh, get quite to that moment, but this very much um, is from that same uh, idea, and it's how he made these, these beautiful prints, so uh, we're thrilled to be able to show nine of them together. And then finally, the last uh, work in the show is the last work by Matisse, uh, uh, the last painting by Matisse that she bought, Two Girls, Red and Green Background, from 1947. Uh, throughout the 40s, you know, Etta was always begging Matisse to sell, sell her more pictures. Uh, it was sort of a constant, uh, a constant in all of her letters. Uh, she couldn't go to Europe after 1938, so from 1938 until her death in 1949, she had to rely on the kindness of dealers in New York. Her, his, his son in particular, Pierre Matisse, sold her quite a few things, but it wasn't at the same level. And for her, I think so much of the pleasure had been in the early years of going to Paris and, or going to Nice and bringing these things home, uh, much like you or I may bring back a souvenir from a trip abroad, um, although at a slightly higher level. Um, uh, so this is a work, uh, it's interesting, in, in doing some research we discovered, in fact, uh, Etta o had purchased a different painting at this period uh, that she brought home and decided she didn't like. And I think it's the only time that I've, we've ever noticed that, that she ever returned anything. That's one of the great things about the Cone Collection is everything that was once there is still there. Uh, but it turned out there was a painting that she just didn't like and returned. And so instead she purchased this work, Two Girls Against a Red and, uh, red and Green Background, um, done just at the final time. You know, he, he started to get really sick in the late 40s. And so this is from his, one of his last series of oil paintings. And you can see he's really stripped down many of the details. You know, it's just pure color, much more abstract. And you can sort of seeing, see him heading towards the cutouts in a little way. 
And you know, one of the wonderful things about it is we've discovered also that the models that, that sat for it were two sisters. And so perhaps, whether Etta knew that or not, we don't know, but it does seem to be a fitting end to a show about the Cone Collection. So that's show one. Uh, I'll be really quick about show two, I promise, because uh, I don't know what time it is, and I'm sure everyone is uh, a little anxious. Oh, no. Wait a minute. There they are. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, the next show, Color and Illusion, The Still Lives of Juan Gris, uh, is a show that I've been thinking about for about five years, uh, uh, and, and I really was uh, very much inspired by the two wonderful paintings by Gris that we have in the collection that were given to us by Sadie Adler May. Uh, one of them in particular, The Painter's Window, is, for, is a, I think his most beautiful late painting, I think a real masterpiece of his collection, uh, of his output, I should say. And I just thought it would be fun to try to find, to try to put together a collection of works by him. You know, he's someone, you know, that, that was one of the most important Cubist artists, great friends with Picasso, uh, was part, has always been, you know, a very respected part of the circle with Picasso and Brock and, and Fernand Leger but he just doesn't have the same name recognition. And he's really underappreciated, and I think when you go into the show, you'll see how, what an incredible artist he was. Uh, there hasn't been a show of his work in this country since 1983. Uh, so it's certainly the first Juan Gris show I've ever seen, um, and I certainly hope there will be more after this one, uh, because his paintings are beautiful. We decided to really just focus on his still lives, uh, which is most of, you know, that's the majority of, of his work, uh, he focused on the still life. But they're wonderful paintings that, where he uses this incredible structure, incredible paint technique. Uh, you know, he loved sort of cafe scenes and they often, um, you know, show newspapers, bottles, glasses, um, uh, and they're just extraordinary works. Uh, there are 40 works in the show, including three collages, which are very, rare, very fragile, and are hardly ever on view. And I, I just hope you go around the corner and, and fall in love with him as much as I have um, and tell all your friends to come and see them. Uh, our painting, The Painter's Window, uh, the late wonderful work is, is the one on the far right um, from 1925. He died at the age of 40, uh, but even in his short career, he, he started painting in about 1910 and died in 1927, so a 17-year career. He still did create at least 600 um, paintings, so there's a, a pretty good amount uh, out there. It's just, um, you know, museums just, you know, they either put him out uh, with friends or that he certainly has been very involved and included in lots of group shows, but there hasn't been that much attention on him for an, a monographic show in a long time. Uh, but our painting on the right, I just think, is so wonderful. It includes the motifs that he used throughout his career, playing cards, a musical instrument, a bowl of fruit um, in an interior set before a window. But it's one of the rare ones where he includes a palette uh, and a paintbrush. So to me, it's sort of an autobiographical statement about his um, experience as a painter. And I, I just think it's so wonderful and, and looks so great with all of its friends, I have to say. So thank you so much. Thank you for your support of the museum, and, uh, and please enjoy, um, and please uh, uh, keep coming back. Uh, it's so nice to see all your faces. Thank you. <laughs>